Good and Bad Nationalisms, A Critique of Dualism by Philip Spencer and Howard Woolman. Introduction. In a famous and influential article written more than 20 years ago, Tom Nairn wrote about the genus face of nationalism. Um, nationalism for him looked both forward and backward. All nationalism is both healthy and morbid. Both progress and regress are inscribed in its genetic code from the start. Nairn was perhaps unusual at the time in trying to deal with the complexity and at times baffling variety of nationalist movements by seeing nationalism as at one and the same time both positive and negative, a legacy perhaps of his background in Marxism. Most other writers have adopted a more dualistic approach, distinguishing more sharply between different kinds of nationalism, marking out more clearly positive and negative poles of reference. This tendency to split nationalism into two fundamentally different types has a long history in the literature, going back at least to the seminal work of Hans Kohn. It can take, as we shall see, a number of different forms, not all of them necessarily consistent or compatible with each other. Whilst this may not in itself be an insuperable problem, although it scarcely inspires confidence, there are, in our view, a number of major difficulties with the dualistic approach. In particular, there seem to us to be related methodological and empirical difficulties which cannot be easily resolved. Methodologically, distinctions are often formulated in terms of some sort of dichotomous, Weberian, ideal types, not existing in a pure form in practice, but useful for comparing against the complexity of political and historical reality. Too often this seems to lead to the complexity being lost sight of in the heat of analysis, and to the ideal type or model coming to stand itself for the reality. An analytical distinction, itself problematic, thus comes to be treated as real. At the same time, it can, it can allow for, if not actively encourage, a certain slipperiness in argument, as writers attacked for overdoing a distinction between, say, civic and ethnic nationalism, can retreat into a defense that they are only making analytical distinctions and that, of course, most nationalisms are a combination of both. Thus, Anthony Smith writes in a recent work, modern nations are simultaneously and necessarily civic and ethnic. Meanwhile, the dichotomy establishes itself thoroughly in the literature. Empirically, certain sharp distinctions do not, in our view, stand up to close scrutiny. Some of the often cited classical historical examples appear to fall rather less than clearly into one side or other of a dichotomy than is often claimed. In the contemporary world too, and perhaps especially, a number of Western liberal democracies in particular, there is, we suggest, a tendency to downplay certain features of nationalism and the nation state whilst maintaining a full critical stance towards other manifestations of nationalism. This is partly due to an ethnocentric base bias or blindness which privileges the West, and partly due to a blindness to some of the contradictions in liberal nationalism itself. As a result, it seems to us there is a kind of utopian character to the work, especially, though not exclusively, of some liberal political theorists as they fail to take account of, to borrow Bogdan Denich's telling phrase, really existing nationalism. Ultimately, this dualistic approach, we argue, raises more problems than it solves. Whilst it would clearly be mistaken to assert that nationalisms are all exactly the same, or to deny that national nationalism can take different forms across time and space, it may be more serious to underestimate what apparently different forms of nationalism have in common and the dangers they may all pose. 
For at the heart of the, of the nationalism as a political project, whatever form it takes, is an essentially exclusionary logic. There must, after all, always be people who are not part of the nation. The nation is always framed with the presumption of the existence of the outsider, the other, against which the nation is itself defined and constructed. The problem of the other is common to all forms of nationalism, constantly creating and recreating the conditions in which supposedly good forms of nationalism turn bad. The problem of dualism is that it obscures and cannot explain this continual slippage and creates the illusion that somehow or other it can be avoided when so much of the evidence points the other way. One, two, many dualisms. It is possible to identify a large number of dualistic distinctions in the, in the literature that we believe have the characteristics which we have mentioned. A cursory list would include all or some of the following. Oh, Jesus, this is just a bunch of words. Western, Eastern, political, cultural. Um, Stats nation, culture nation, civic, ethnic, liberal, illiberal, individualistic, collectivist, voluntarist, organic, rational, mystical, emotional, universalistic, particularistic, patriotism, chauvinism, modern patriotism, extreme patriotism, French Enlightenment, German Romanticism, contracts, Volk, constitutional authoritarian, national identity, nationalism, uh, Jesselshaft, Geimenshaft, I don't know, legal, rational, traditional, historic nations, non-historic nations, nationalism of the oppressed, nationalism of the oppressor, national liberation, imperialism. Some of these distinctions in the literature are more influential than others. Some are overlapping, some refer to specific writers, others refer to more general tendencies. Whilst there is clearly not space here to provide an exhaust exhaustive treatment of all of these, it seems appropriate to highlight a central set which are closely re related in terms of their foci of concern and which be may be understood in a sense as part of the same basic matrix. The contrasts specifically between West and East, between the political and the cultural, between the civic and ethnic, between the liberal and illiberal, are all, we may argue, hewn from the same rock. They emerge to some degree sequentially and to some degree as successive reformulations. Separately and collectively, they are arguably at the core of the dualistic enterprise, seeking to arrive at the same point at a clear and unambiguous point of distinction and contrast. If this point cannot in fact be reached even by these routes, it may be argued perhaps it cannot be reached at all. West and East. One of the earliest distinctions may be thought of on the face of it as more geographical than conceptual. This is the distinction between nationalism in its Western and its Eastern forms. Although less obviously in vogue today, it has played a prominent role in the work of some major writers on nationalism, from Cohn to Plemenets and the late Ernest Gellner, writers whose work has spanned some 60 years and still remains influential today. Of course, this distinction can never be, and was never intended to be merely geographical. Rather, the words West and East functioned as containers of a sort to be filled with a particular and heavily value-laden content. According to Cohn, nationalism developed in the West first and along singular lines. It was the product of the Enlightenment, of the Age of Reason, an essential expression of the confidence of rational and especially bourgeois individuals wishing to pursue their legitimate interests. Eastern nationalism, by contrast, developed in a profoundly different environment along quite different lines and, importantly, in reaction to the, 
to the success and confidence of the West. Plamenat's, in turn, identifies in the West a nationalism of peoples who for some reason feel themselves at a disadvantage, but who are nevertheless culturally equipped in ways that favor success and excellence measured by standards which are widely accepted and fast spreading, and which first arose among them and other peoples culturally akin to them. In contrast to this, the Eastern model represents the nationalism of peoples recently drawn into a civilization hitherto alien to them and whose ancestral cultures are not adapted to success and excellence by these cosmopolitan and increasingly dominant standards. This is the nationalism of peoples who feel the need to transform themselves and in so doing to raise themselves, of peoples who come to be called backward and who would not be nationalists if this kind, of this kind unless they both recognized this backwardness and wanted to overcome it. Both writers seem to suggest that the Eastern model is characterized by an inferiority complex, which produces an impatience and intolerance that is a far cry from the rationalistic, constitutional Western model. A similar sense that the West is the model to which others aspire, or ought to, and to which they will sooner or later gravitate, underpins Gellner's notion of the different nationalisms of different time zones steadily moving westward as they go, or perhaps as he went. There are a number of perhaps obvious objections to this whole approach. The West-East dichotomy may perhaps be only a metaphor, but it is, even on its own terms, a somewhat crude and inaccurate one, and liable to cause disagreements even among its proponents. Is Germany located in the East? It may be if one starts in Britain or France. For Cohn, it is Eastern, while for Plemenats, it is Western. But what then of Ireland, which even Cohn puts in the Eastern camp? Even France, on one account, falls into the non-Western camp if one follows Leah Greenfeld's recent attempt to identify resentment against the West, in this case Great Britain, as the key element on the formation of French nationalism. More serious than any difficulties in acknowledging that the world is after all round and not flat, or more accurately, a globe, is the problem of the set of heavily value-laden assumptions that underpin the use of the concepts of backwardness, inferiority, and incompleteness. These may be rooted in what Stuart Hall has called the discourse of the West and the rest, developed over hundreds of years of unequal contact, imperialism and colonialism founded on elements of power and coercion. This discourse has deep historical origins in the form of the opposition between East and West, going back to Roman and Greek hostility to the barbarian others from the East, to the schism in Christianity between Eastern Orthodoxy and Western Catholicism, to Christianity's struggle with Islam and the, con and the contempt of some Enlightenment thinkers for the East. This perception of cultural backwardness has been a major factor in the importance many nations give to being European and in being as near to Western or at least Central Europe as possible. It may be noted that the term East Central Europe has become more popular since the fall of communism as one way of carving out more differentiation among the countries of Eastern Europe. Further still to the East from Western Europe, there has long been a similar underestimation of Chinese or Indian civilization, which puts these even deeper into this state of Eastern idiocy. The profoundly ethnocentric sense of Western superiority, which informs this particular dualism, can then all too easily blind writers to the deficiencies of Western nationalism as they rush to denounce that of the East. For it is not too difficult to point to a number of the characteristics of supposedly Eastern nationalism, which appear to feature in Western nationalism, enough to make the distinction very murky. Waves of resentment against others for stealing our jobs or swamping our culture have been a staple feature of right-wing both extreme and mainstream nationalist discourse in France, Britain, and the USA for many years. 
the fruits of intolerance have produced the widespread occurrence of acts of racial violence in many parts of the West, now for decades or more. Even the emotionally attributed even the emotionality attributed to Eastern nationalism has been clearly visible in the West, whether in situations such as the manufactured nationalism of the Falklands War in Britain, or the more routine celebrations of the nation in sporting triumphs and national commemorations. Political versus cultural nationalism. One of the primary distinctions that filled the East-West containers was the contrast between Western political and Eastern cultural forms of nationalism. In locating the origins of Western nationalism in the Enlightenment project, Cohn saw it as a part of a more general movement to limit governmental power and to secure civic rights. Its purpose was to create a liberal and rational civil society. Thus, for example, English and American nationalism was in its origin connected with the concepts of individual liberty and represented nations firmly constituted in their political life. Intimately connected then with the liberal revolt against absolutism, with the opening up of society, and as we shall see with democracy, Western political nationalism was progressive, modern, the creation of the present if not oriented to the future. The cultural form of nationalism, which according to Cohen emerged in the East, was a reaction to this, opposed to its core values and driven by a quite different dynamic. It emerged in lands which were in political ideas and social structure less advanced than the modern West. There was only a weak middle class. The nation was split between a feudal aristocracy and a rural proletariat. Thus, nationalism became a cultural movement led to oppose the alien example and its liberal and, and rational outlook. Cultural nationalism looked elsewhere for its justification, finding it not in reason, but in emotion, not in the present, but in the past, turning inwards to the imagination, to tradition, to history, and to nature. The sharpness of the contrast between the political and the cultural roots of different forms of nationalism is, however, hard to sustain when we seek to apply it to particular cases. Nations that are purportedly models of the political form of nationalism appear both positively to exhibit a signal pride in the achievements of their own culture and negatively to experience recurring anxieties about its health, security, even viability. On the one hand, this kind of pride may be seen to underpin the assimilationist assumptions of, for instance, the French model of citizenship. As Mitchell and Russell have argued, referring explicitly to the French model, a logic of assimilation clearly underpins this ideal type. Cultural assimilation is the price that must be paid for integration into the political community. On the other hand, pride may be replaced by something more negative, to fears that this culture is vulnerable under attack, threatened by the diluting and sapping presence of particular minorities. Movements have thus arisen, such as the Front National, which, however disingenuously, explicitly eschew the overt racism of predecessors, such as the Action Française, in asserting the need to defend French culture. Whether this amounts to a new form of racism is not yet the issue here. Rather, it is necessary to point to the importance of cultural underpinnings for suppo supposedly political nationalisms, underpinnings which have to be fortified and sustained against both external and internal threats. Thus, for some, the existence of supposedly distinct and different national cultures underpinning the identity of West European states poses a serious barrier to moves in the direction of further European integration. For others, such as David Miller, it is vital to mount a sustained argument for the existence and defense of a distinct, if not static, national culture against the disintegrating appeals of radical multiculturalists. This may also involve the imposition of significant restrictions on immigration, as Miller seems to suggest may be needed to deal with Mexicans arriving in California, 
in order not to stretch the education system and other mechanisms of cultural integration beyond their capacity. At this point, the line between open political and closed cultural nationalism may seem blurred indeed. Defense may, of course, also turn into attack. Pride need not necessarily be confined to the perhaps haughty presumption for assimilation within the culturally given nation, but may also, under some circumstances, be converted into a more arrogant, externally directed impulse. John Scharr has argued, for example, for an American form of political nationalism or patriotism founded on the political principles of liberty, equality, and self-government. As Margaret Canavan has observed, however, this can all too easily turn into talk of a mission to educate others, to inculcate the values of one particular, our culture. How different is this from old-fashioned imperialism or the particular pedagogic missions which British or French nationalism felt in their day to be their destiny or duty? Such dynamics of pride, fear, and arrogance may all derive from a profound sense that political nationalism cannot itself exist without a vivid and strong sense of its own cultural identity. They may lead to forms of nationalist politics which bear little resemblance to Cohn's optimistic picture, but in which given states seek either to impose their culture on others internally through assimilation or externally as imperialism, or in order to defend its purportedly intrinsic identity, exclude or raise barriers against others. Civic versus ethnic nationalism. If the distinction between a good political and a bad cultural form of nationalism is then problematic, one alternative may be to, di to distinguish between a civic and an ethnic form. In some ways, this can be seen as an extension or reformulation of the political cultural distinction, drawing out more fully the implication of the civic element in Cohn's original formulation, and following him, locating this firmly in the West. Thus, for Smith, historic territory, legal political community, legal political equality of members, and common civic culture and ideology, these are the components of the standard Western model of the nation. Or in Ignatieff's more popular work, civic nationalism maintains that the nation should be composed of all those, regardless of race, color, creed, gender, language, or ethnicity, who subscribe to the nation's political creed. This nationalism is called civic because it envisages the nation as a community of equal rights bearing citizens united in patriotic attachment to a shared set of political practices and values. In this civic model, the nation is seen to be constructed freely as an association of citizens, to borrow Schwartz Mantel's formulation. The national polity comes into being on a voluntary willed basis. It is the product of agreement, of consent, the polity is thus simultaneously national and democratic. This nationalism is necessarily democratic since it vests sovereignty in all of the people. The members of the civic nation are those who have rights and obligations as citizens of this polity. Within the borders of the nation, on its soil, all may be citizens, according to the principle of Iasoli. Membership is thus in some sense open, or at least not closed off in any, any a priori way. In the ethnic model, by contrast, the nation is, as Smith again defines it, first and foremost a community of common descent. Nations are the product of history and to the extent that people are born into them, and a sense of nature too. Rather than free associations based on residence, they are historically determined entities, based on ancestry. The nation is thus a given, a fate, from which none may escape. As Smith puts it, whether you stayed in your community or emigrated to another, you remained ineluctably, organically, a member of the community of your birth, and were forever stamped by it. One cannot at the most basic level choose to join this or that nation.
the nation is overtly exclusive, closed rather than open. No one can become Kurd, Latvian, or Tamil through adopting Kurdish, etc. ways. Citizenship is acquired by birth, through blood, determined by Ias Sanguinis, not by Ias Soli. The classic European examples of civic and ethnic nations, again placed along west-east lines, are generally held to be France and Germany. There is a long tradition in the literature going back to Cohn and forward to the recent work of Rogers Brubecker, for whom even today the opposition between the French and German understandings of nationhood and forms of nationalism remains indispensable. The intellectual origins of this distinction may be traced back to German intellectuals such as um, Meinig on the one side and French writers such as Michelet and Renan on the other. In Renan's famous formulation, a nation is the actual consent, the desire to live together. The existence of a nation is an everyday plebiscite. It is not, however, wholly clear how seriously we are intended to or can take the notion of a daily plebiscite. This seems more of a romantic gesture, part of a rhetoric which, on closer inspection, has closer affinities than might at first appear with the object of its own critique. As Silverman has argued, the division between French Western rationalism and German Eastern romanticism is problematic. An analysis of Renan's lecture shows that his concept of the nation is informed by ideas of the spirit and tradition. Much of the imagery he uses is in keeping with the so-called Germanist tradition. His reference to the nation as a spiritual principle invokes the counter-revolutionary discourse informed by the romanticism of Herder. As Silverman suggests, this may help to explain the ease with which the racist ideologue Maurice Bars and the racist movement Action Française claimed Renan as one of their own, apart from the often forgotten fact that Renan was initially quite enthusiastic about racist ideas himself. It may be possible to dismiss the appropriation of this classic expression of civic nationalism by the other side as something of an exception, or as an instance of the way in which, in the history of ideas, Arguments can be twisted and turned in unpredictable ways, caught up in currents and shifts which have their own peculiar logic. The difficulties, however, do not stop there. A key element in the civic nationalism argument is the idea of association, the notion that the nation is brought into being or sustained by the agreement of its members. It may, however, be more difficult than is often claimed either to point with any certainty to such a defining moment or to entirely convincing evidence for freely given consent. Many writers refer rather uncritically to the French Revolution as one such moment, a time in which a nation, France, was created by, as Alter puts it, an act of will with the nation as a community of responsible citizens expressing a common political will through the state, constituted, in theory at least, by individual commitment to the ideas of 1789 and to the Grand Patry. Leaving aside the argument that the French Revolution was not one event, but several, it has to be said that the number of individuals who in 1789 were in a position to commit themselves to the nation, and certainly to receive in turn equal political recognition, was somewhat limited. Even at its democratic high point, there were after all, rather severe restrictions on democratic inclusion in revolutionary France, not least in terms of gender. The fact that women only gained the right to vote in France in 1945 is all too often glossed over in this context. Indeed, it could be argued that in certain respects, the dynamics of democratic participation and nationalist mobilization came into conflict. Florence Gauthier has pointed to the way in which more aggressive nationalism at any rate went along with significant restrictions on democratic rights. As Thermidor both curtailed the popular movement and trenching power in fewer, richer hands, it also opened the way to wars of conquest. Thus, so far from it being the case that nationalism was in its origins 
an idea of revolutionary democracy. It may well be more accurate, as Gautier argues, to say that the nationalism of the French as conquerors was due to the failure of the rights of man and the citizen. The English example favored by other writers may be no more persuasive. Leah Greenfeld, for instance, who has developed a version of the civic ethnic contrast connected to the opposition between individualism and collectivism, uses England as her favored example, or one might say that she gives England most favored nation status. For her, the transformation in the meaning of the word nation linked to profound structural transformations in 15th and 16th century English society produced a form of nationalism which elevated every member of the community, which it made sovereign. Within this civic individualist, individualist version of the nation, in principle, all could be members of a homogeneously noble nation. In reality, as even Greenfeld recognizes, this principle was rather heavily compromised historically by the systematic exclusion of the vast majority of the population such as women, servants, Catholics, the poor, from the exercise of civic or democratic rights, and thus the possibility of actively and politically expressing their assent to the nation. The democratic ideal of the civic conception of the nation may then have been honored more in the breach than in the performance. The same was true for the ideals of the American Revolution, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which did not apply to black slaves, Native Americans, or again, women. The point here is not to apply anachronistic standards to the radical Democrats of past times, but to point out the flaws, limitations, and exclusions that were present at the birth of Western democracy and the democratic nation. The problem is that these flaws are not simply of historical interest. Problems of exclusion from rights of citizenship continue to haunt the liberal, democratic nations, and the problem of the alien other is still a feature of civic nationalism. Active political consent has always been a continuing concern, as much in cited examples of civic as well as ethnic nations. In reality, few states have counted on the spontaneous loyalty of their populations to the nation without regularly intervening in various ways. Billig has draws has drawn attention to the banal nationalism, which is flagged daily in ways that often go unrecognized or unremarked, and indeed which become so routine that they are hardly noticed at all, or seem to become internalized, to use a psychological term. Although there are important ceremonial and ritual occasions where the collective, the nation, is celebrated, these are only occasional. The flagged signs of nationhood are encountered daily. Thus, national identity is not repressed into the unconscious. It remains daily reproduced. Nationalist flagging provides the framework for contemporary politics. The daily rhetoric of we, us, society, etc. constantly invokes, by implication, the nation. Even weather forecasting in newspapers and broadcasting in, is implicitly national. Sport, too, is a central site of this daily flagging, often emphasizing masculinity and sharing an affinity with war and its metaphors, with similar themes of heroism and sacrifice. Battling for honor against foreigners is a preparation for more serious conflicts, and it is enacted daily. One important feature of Billig's contribution is to remind us that nationalism is not simply confined to extreme movements or to ethnically based ones or to movements aspiring to new state or autonomous status. Banal and sometimes not so banal nationalism also forms an important component of legitimation for and the manufacturing of consent in established modern states. Without confidence in the loyalty of its citizens, even the civic nation state may not rest easy. When it comes to deciding who may or may not be the citizens, this anxiety may be so powerful that it renders the contrast between civil and ethnic nationalisms altogether more problematic than it first appears. It is often argued that civic nationhood is more open, more inclusive, more expansive than ethnic nationhood.
Since ethnic nationhood is defined in terms of birth, it is only open to those born into the ethno ethnos and close to those who are not. Different legal principles underpin these different conceptions of nationhood. Under Ayas Soli, citizenship may be ascribed to all persons residing within a given set of borders. Under Ayas Sanguinis, citizenship can only be ascribed to children of citizens. It is, however, difficult to find clear, unambiguous, and consistent applications of the principle of Ayas Soli in many Western civic nations. Neither France nor Britain, held up by Brubacher as an even better case in this regard, along with the USA, have held consistently and confidently to the principle of Ayas Soli for complex reasons that in many ways go to the heart of the problem of the dualistic approach. According to Brubacher, although based to some degree on the principle of Ayas Sanguinis, citizenship laws in France has supplemented this with significant elements of Ayas Soli. Thus, France and Germany represent polar cases. French citizenship law includes a substantial territorial component. German citizenship law, none at all. Most other Western European Ayas Sanguinis countries include some complementary elements of Ayas Soli, without going as far as France. However, whilst this has been the case for much of this century, it was not always so, or always for the same reasons, and has in recent years come under severe and prolonged pressure, as Brubacher himself noted already at the beginning of the decade. Historically, historically, Ayas Soli in France far from being the product of democ democratization, was the dominant principle in France before the revolution, under the ancient regime. It was then pushed back under Napoleon. As Whale notes, it was decided that birth within the borders of the country was not enough to guarantee the loyalty of the children of those foreigners born in France. Symbol Ayas Soli was then rejected and replaced by citizenship based on blood ties. It was not until much later in the Third Republic that Ayas Soli was readopted, and again concerns about loyalty were uppermost in the minds of policymakers. Now in a context of sustained enmity between France and Germany, the presence on French soil of residents who did not possess French citizenship and were therefore not obliged to do military service was seen to be both unfair to French citizens who were burdened by this duty and potentially dangerous. The readoption of Ayas Soli accompanied by a rigorous program of socialization involving what Brubacher himself calls moral and civic indoctrination in a national educational system can make loyal citizens of them all. Ayas Soli in, in these circumstances may be better understood as a state project to ensure citizenship for the potentially recalcitrant to instill Republican loyalties where they did not spontaneously exist, as a measure imposed from above on the politically powerless, if not passive, then as a product of political mobilization from below, as an outcome of active democratic participation and consent. Since then, the ascription of citizenship on these grounds has been periodically but powerfully attacked. Anti-Semitic movements of various kinds sought to strip Jews of their citizenship, as Pierre Birnbaum has strikingly documented. More recently, More recently, hostility has shifted or widened to take in other targets identified variously as Muslims, North Africans, Arabs, but always as alien others. Whilst this has been the primary focus of the Front National, mainstream politicians, particularly on the right, have articulated similar themes and pushed, with some success now, for legislation which would revise French citizenship laws in a more ethnic and exclusivist direction.
In a recent work, Anthony Smith, drawing on the French example, has argued similarly, the civic nationalisms of the Western European variety can be every bit as severe and uncompromising as ethnic nationalisms. In an extraordinary passage which, se which seems to undermine the whole distinction between civic and ethnic nationalism, he writes, so the pedagogical narrative of Western democracies turns out to be every bit as demanding and rigorous and in practice ethnically one-sided as are those of non-Western authoritarian state nations, since it assumes the assimilation of ethnic minorities within the borders of the nation state through acculturation to a hegemonic majority ethnic culture. In Britain, as Cesarani pointed out, citizenship laws have developed in a confused and uncertain manner, tied up with shifting defini definitions of national identity and the object of struggles over rights and obligations. Carol Phillips has argued that the once great colonial power that is Britain has always sought to define her people and by extension the nation itself by identifying those who don't belong. This has taken various forms from attempts to construct models of the true born Englishman to the forging of Britons analyzed by Linda Colley in the course of prolonged conflict with France. Whether English or British, this identity has been premised on the existence of a dangerous other to be suppressed, fought, or excluded. The war with revolutionary France, central to Colley's account, was, it may be noted, with another civic nation itself, as we have seen, often taken to prove the intrinsic connection between nationalism and democracy. To the extent, then, that the British nation was forged in a violent counter-revolutionary project aimed at precisely this hostile other, one might argue that its civic character is at its best contradictory, rooted in conflict not just with another civic nation, but with large sections of its own population. Perhaps more seriously, the fiction of a tolerant, open British nation willing to accord citizenship to all residing within its borders has little basis in the historical record. The desire and imperative to exclude from the nation has been a constant motif in debates about citizenship ever since the mid-18th century, agitation against the so-called Jew Bill, if not before. This century in particular, there's, there has been an insistent drift to the adoption of more and more racist criteria. From the Aliens Act of 1905, directed primarily against Jews from Eastern Europe, to the British Nationality Act of 1981, directed primarily against non-whites, and which, in Cesarini's words, exceeded all previous legislation by abrogating the principle of Ayas Soli. Such le legislation exposed the racialized character of British nationality, reflecting the bitterly polarized and at once extreme at one extreme racist understanding of British nationality in the mid 1980s. Citizenship in these civic nations is thus no longer, if it ever was, so open. There are real and harsh restrictions on joining these nations, which may be matched by a parallel lack of civility in their internal life. Insofar as racist campaigns against potential immigrants are accompanied and fortified by racist attacks on particular and defined others within, it would surely be difficult to sustain with any great confidence the claim that racism in either of these connected forms is weaker today in the civic nations of France and Britain, not to mention the USA, than in the ethnic nation of Germany, although differences remain in criteria for citizenship. <clears throat> the increasingly overt racism of such civic nations may be rooted in a recurring anxiety about the other, however defined and wherever located, responses to which expose fundamental difficulties with the construction of civic rather than ethnic foundations for the nation. This anxiety may focus on the presence of foreigners of dubious loyalty who may have to have citizenship forced upon them or from whom it may have to be forcibly wrested. It may generate denial whether that others have always been here or of their rights once here. It may lead to the erection of barriers to keep them out. However, as long as the others perceived in inherently hostile terms, 
that are also in a fundamental sense constitutive and defining of the identity of the nation itself. The distinction between civic and ethnic is hard to sustain or apply. To see recent policies in particular as merely contingent, the result of specific historically atypical political pressures in the present, forcing hitherto impeccably civic nations to abandon or retreat from long-held beliefs or deeply cherished traditions, seems unconvincing. Rather, they may be better understood in terms of a shifting repertoire of responses to a problem for which there is, within the nationalist frame of reference, no easy or good answer. The drift to ethnic criteria, to ayas sanguinis, may be understood as, at best, a search for firmer ground, a more certain answer to a question that will not go away. For once we strip away some of the rhetoric surrounding the civic model, the notion that it is a wholly free association of citizens, simultaneously national and democratic, sustained by daily plebiscites, open and welcoming to actual and potential citizens, we are faced with the issue of how nations, even civic ones, are bounded, limited, and defined. What above all is to be done about the other, against whom even the civic nation must in some fundamental sense define itself? Liberal versus illiberal nationalism. One answer to this question in its own way, a further reformulation of the political, cultural, civic, ethnic dualism, is that there is a good form of nationalism which anchored in or tied to liberal beliefs and values. Oh, I lost my place. Can indeed tolerate the existence of the other perfectly well. In this liberal version, nationalism recognizes the rights of other nations to exist. It is moderate in ambition and temperament, valuing loyalty to and identification with the nation, but not in excess, and not to the extent that this would override other values and commitments. It sees national commitments as understandable and legitimate, not merely emotional, but since it recognizes the rights of other nations to self-determination, it balances particularism, loyalty to this nation, with universalism, all may be loyal to their nation. The contrast here, often more implicit than explicit, would be within a liberal form of nationalism. This would be wary of, if not actively hostile to, other nations, suspicious of the claims of others to new rights, jealous of its own keen, of its own keen to pursue ancient or rediscovered claims and thus potentially irredentist. It could be more demanding of the commitment of its members, especially emotionally, seeing loyalty to the nation as the supreme good, overriding other commitments, demanding, if necessary, the supreme sacrifice. It would thus be particularist rather than universalist. One of the first proponents of liberal nationalism was Mazzini, for whom it was not an aggressive doctrine, but an open and generous one. His heart stirred at the success of other struggles for self-determination, which would lead to the creation of a world, or at least a Europe, made up of a number of free and independent nations, each with its own distinguishing characteristics and calling or mission. Relationships between these nations would be entirely harmonious as a result, as each nation would recognize the freedom of others to pursue their destiny but also because the different missions in some sense comp complemented each other. Thus, as Atler notes, England's calling was to industrialize and create overseas colonies, Russia's to civilize Asia and Italy's to lead the world as a new Rome. Whether past, present or future colonies, Asia or indeed the rest of the world could share Mazzini's enthusiasm for these various missions um, may perhaps be doubted. In any case, when it came to specifying which or how many nations were to be included in his 1857 map of the new Europe, it appeared that space was rather restricted. The Irish, Danish, and Portuguese, for instance, were to be denied entry, according to his biographer Max Smith, on the grounds that they lacked a positive mission for humanity. It may, of course, be argued that the particular prejudices of this or that thinker do not in themselves invalidate the general line of argument. 
Conversely, it is difficult to see how much purchase Mazzini's vision were we to make allowances for the odd, if revealing inconsistency, has ever had on reality, or tells us very much about really existing nationalism, past or present. In the real world, nationalist movements, which, if they may originally have found some inspiration in these ideas, did so in terms of their own particular causes. And a fortiori nation states once established do not appear to have shown any great interest in recognizing the rights of others to pursue claims and rights like their own. These seem always to have had to be fought for, rested as the outcome of violent conflict, rather than accorded in a context of discussion, negotiation, or in tribunals, as Margaret Canavan has pointed out. This, it has to be said, was apparent almost from the outset. English nationalism, Greenfeld's preferred model, was, as David Kaiser has commented, under Cromwell, brutally imp imperial in its treatment of Ireland, and suppressed other nationalist movements, notably the Indian, with similar ferocity throughout the following centuries. French nationalism became overtly annexationist, as we have noted, quite soon during the revolution, certainly from Thermidor onwards. Later in 1848, German liberals distinguished themselves in the Frankfurt Assembly with what Wolf describes as their contemptuous dismissal of the claims of other nationalities. The so-called Spring of the Peoples was of severe disappointment for many, not just because of the failure of the liberal revolutionaries to defeat the forces of reaction, but because it became rapidly apparent that more powerful nationalist movements could not resist the temptation to impose their will on weaker ones. Later, after the First World War, many of the newly recognized nation states of Eastern Europe proved intolerant of nationalist movements in their own areas, Polish treatment of Ukrainians being a case in point. Even most recently, the assertion of national rights in post-communist Eastern Europe has generated further instances of intolerance and suppression, most appallingly in the case of Bosnia, where Serbian and Croatian nationalist leaders have done their utmost to deny the right of national self-determination to others in both word and deed. It may not be enough to see all these instances as either failures of principle or as examples of another illiberal kind of nationalism. There may be more profound reasons why liberal principles may have such little purchase on nationalist movements, especially once these have gained control of their own states. Giddens has argued that the nation state is above all the preeminent power container of the modern era, which in successfully achieving the formalized monopoly over the means of violence within its own territory, necessarily engages in sustained processes of internal pacification. Given this, it is hard to see how or why nation states would ever have any incentive to accord the right of self-determination to groups defining themselves as national within their own borders. It may be easier to accord this right to others elsewhere, of course, but this may well be to do with rather different considerations in which recognition may itself be a lever to gain more power for one's own nation. Leaving this aside, it is in any case not clear that the liberal belief that loyalty to the nation should not and need not override other values can be sustained either theoretically or empirically. For some indeed, it is precisely this exclusivity of claim that defines nationalism. Thus, for Rock, nationalism is that outlook which gives an absolute priority to the values of the nation over all other values and interests. Whilst for Gellner, nationalism promotes the view that obligations to the nation override all other pub public obligations. However, a number of writers recently have sought to challenge this argument from within a liberal or progressive frame of reference. Neil McCormick argues that it is morally intolerable to claim that the nation overrides all other claims on the individual, and he argues against those who have taken nationalism to mean precisely that. Yale Tamir claims that the main characteristic of liberal nationalism is that it fosters national ideals without losing sight of other human values against which, in, fuck, against which national ideals ought to be weighed. 
Indeed, Tamir argues that without national identification, it would be difficult to develop the capacity to make such choices. For Tamir, membership in a national culture is part of the essence of being human. The nation provides a context or framework in which it becomes possible for individuals to become autonomous, self-determining human agents. Life in a cultural environment that is familiar, understandable, and thus predictable is a necessary precondition for making rational choices and becoming self-governing. It is not clear, however, why this cultural environment has to be a national one. It might be argued indeed that Tamir here assumes precisely what needs to be argued for. As Canavan has pointed out, we cannot use sharing the same culture as a criterion of nationhood because, because it is precisely the fact that features are specific to a particular nation that makes these features count as culture. The tension that might then be set up between loyalty to the nation and other values also tends to be too easily dismissed within this frame of reference. For Tamir, liberal nationalism thus celebrates the particular or particularity of culture together with the universality of human rights, the social and cultural embeddedness of individuals together with their personal autonomy. Similarly, Neil McCormick seeks to turn this argument on its head. Could one learn to love mankind universally if one had not first learned to love people in the concrete and the narrow range? The weight of empirical evidence seems, however, to point very much in the opposite direction. Loyalty to the nation has all too often blocked sympathy for others defined as belonging to a different nation, often grotesquely and barbarically. In the recent war over Bosnia, part of the horror stemmed from the sight of people butchering former neighbors with whom they had appeared to live comfortably and amicably for decades, a slaughter legitimated by the belief that these were now members of another nation and thus had to be cleansed. It seems more honest to acknowledge that there may rather be a clash between particular and universal commitments. David Miller, in his recent attempt to defend nationalism, argues indeed that it is right that loyalty to the nation should take precedence. For him, not only is universalism incompatible with nationalism, but we have special responsibilities to our fellow nationals, which in some sense ought to come first. National identity here is taken as inescapable, a given, as real, and thus a legitimate way of understanding your place in the world. We cannot follow what he derives as a radical chooser model, which is favored by Tamir, but are born in some profound way into national identities. Partly as a result, or in any case, universalism is, he argues, simply too heroic to inspire the behavior of ordinary people. Here we have the inverse of the utopianism of a Tamir or a McCormick, a purported realism which rules out alternatives to nationalism as impractical, as impossibly demanding. Whether his pessimism is wholly justified is not a question we have space to discuss here. What is crucial is the argument that, because national identity is real, the different duties we owe to our fellow nationals can be, have to be, justified. In restricting choice to a limited reflection on identity within the framework of the national, however, Miller assumes we cannot choose to reject the fundamental dichotomy of national and other, which may be the source of the problem. For what Miller and Tamir have in common may be as important as what divides them. Both the potentially naive utopianism of the one and the seemingly harsh realism of the other are premised on the need to distinguish between the national and the other, a distinction which in the end seems to undermine the crucial premises of the liberal nationalist position. Either the problem of what to do about the other is elided, or ignored in a wholly utopian fashion, so that the balance between the universal and the particular is asserted against the evidence, or that balance cannot in fact be sustained and one value does in the end override others. Either way seems problematic. Rather than liberal nationalism representing a good, coherent alternative to a bad, a liberal one, it seems that it is an unstable amalgam, a hybrid of incompatible elements, which may fall apart, as in the above cases, under the particular pressures of what to do about the other, who, if not actively denigrated or denied, is always of secondary concern 
and whose rights, if not suppressed, are downplayed, and whose fundamental status is always inferior. Conclusion, the problem of the other. We have tried in this paper to examine some of the deficiency in the tradition of dividing nationalisms into, do, into two distinct types. The dualistic models that we have discussed are highly interlinked and depend on implicit or explicit assumptions that there are good and bad or bad and tolerable forms of nationalism. Many writers continue to insist that there is a clear choice only between different forms of nationalism, whether this is, as for Ignatif, to guarantee the security and rights we all need to lead cosmopolitan rights, or to construct what Nairn calls a durable and bearable disorder. There are, as we have sought to show here, a number of ways in which this sort of approach is flawed. As we move from west to east, from political to cultural, from civic to ethnic, from liberal, liberal to illiberal, and back again, we see the recurrence of a pattern that is common to all of them. That pattern is the problem of the other, against which all definitions of the nation are constructed. Nationalism, however benign in form, must always seek to define the nation by reference to something else that it is not. The problem of forming boundaries and defining who falls in one side and who fall in the other is still at the heart of the nationalist project. The use of binary opposition seems ubiquitous in many areas of social and cultural analysis. However, if we are to grasp the realities of nationalism, we may need to transcend the sort of dualistic approaches we have sought to analyze here and their search for a good nationalism, a search which we believe is likely to prove chimerical.